Well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Song of Songs, chapter 1. We left a couple verses in our study, and we hope to get a little ways into chapter 2, but we won't get very far. This is the third reflection. There's multiple reflections throughout this song. This is the third one. And if I were to title it, I think it would be Conversations in the Countryside. Conversations in the Countryside. I, this thought came to my mind. I found it alarming and humorous at the same time. But what if someone showed up to Solomon's porch and said, I want to pay the way for every couple to go on a little retreat in the countryside of their choosing. All expenses paid, one catch. We get to record all of your conversations from start to finish, and we want to make it public for all to read. Like I said, I found that alarming and humorous because I thought, wow, I wonder, I wonder what that read would be like. Well, we have the privilege of listening to this couple in courtship, having a conversation speaking to each other back and forth. And the Lord has seen fit for us to be able to hear this. And for good reason, because I believe he's wanting us to learn from it. We're still in Act 1. Act 1, there's three acts in this song. Act 1 is this, serenaded by the shepherd. We're still in the courtship phase. There are differing opinions on a lot of the things that are in this song. Some believe, as we'll see, that this is a, a, a banquet place and, and that type of thing. I am not one that believes that, as we'll see. I believe, I believe they're in the countryside. I believe they're in an outdoor escape adventure. Remember, the Shulamite... She works in Solomon's vineyard. She's, her family are hired hands to tend the vineyard. And this stranger, this shepherd has come along and captured her attention and her love. And they're in this stage where they're getting to know one another and they're, they're falling in love and they're talking back and forth. And so no doubt they would escape from the vineyard and they would walk along the countryside and so we're we've got the privilege of listening in to that conversation and I believe if we'll allow the Lord it will bless us so we picked up in verse well we left off verse 14 so we'll pick up in verse 15 now a quick reminder when we hear my love that is Solomon speaking to the Shulamite. When we hear my beloved, that is the Shulamite speaking to Solomon. And that's important because when we get to verse 1 of chapter 2, some people are going to be let down because of what they have heard by many within the church. But let's look at verse 15. Behold... Thou art fair, my love. So this is Solomon speaking. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes. Notice he repeats himself. This word fair in the Hebrew means beautiful. He says, you are beautiful. But he doesn't just say it once. He says it twice. And notice at the beginning of each time he says it, he says, behold. He's wanting her to see what he sees. He's wanting her to know what he knows. So he's not just saying, oh, you're beautiful. You're beautiful. He's saying, behold, you're beautiful. He's, it's as if he's saying, would you take a look at yourself? Mm -hmm. 
I've heard many of your conversations and you've heard mine. When we're speaking of the Lord and we're speaking of our walk. And this is encouraging to me because it lets me know that the porch is not filled with prideful people, but... I've never heard any of you say, you know, the Lord is so fortunate to have me. I mean, I, I'm sure of all the followers he has, it's, it's probably what keeps him going that I'm in that number, right? We, we just don't talk like that. We, we, we downplay ourselves, and I think sometimes probably even more than we ought to. We, we move from fact in reality, into our own shame and guilt and self-consciousness and that type of thing. And we, we downplay ourselves so much. And I just wondered tonight if we could hear the Holy Spirit saying, Behold, thou art fair, my love. Thou art fair. You're beautiful to me. Now, we would immediately be like, wait, wait a minute, how, how could you... But let's keep in mind, we are created in the very image of God. And everything that he made was good. It was good. It was good. It was good. It was good until the sixth day. And he says, behold, it is very good. It's not just good. It is very good. You are beautiful. The Bible says he brings beauty from ashes. And we studied in Ecclesiastes where he says he makes everything beautiful in his time. How many of you know that he is making us beautiful? He's beautifying us. He's preparing us for a special occasion on the horizon when we're going to see him. It's, it's what we call sanctification, right, theologically. And, and John says, you know, we don't know what we're going to look like. But here's what we do know. That when we finally see him, when he comes and we see him as he is, we're going to be made like him. And none of us would struggle saying, Lord, you're beautiful. And he's making us, right? We were predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. He's beautifying us. Now, Yes, of course, we shouldn't go off and get the big head and think, ha, ha, ha. But, but I, I do think the Holy Spirit would tell us it is okay to allow him to define you. Yeah. Right? We shouldn't go around saying, I'm this and I'm that and I'm, you know, all that and a bag of chips. But when God says something of you, don't resist it. Amen. Don't let your insecurities and your fears and, and what, what somebody else said of you, or don't, don't let that get in the way, right? This is a conversation. They say in a relationship, one of the most important things is communication. And from that word, communication is where we get communion, right? God's trying to bring us into this place, this, this conversation in the courtyard. And let's, let's be reminded that in the very beginning of all the things that God could have done, he planted a garden eastward in Eden. There he placed the man, and for one reason, so that he could walk with him in the cool of the day. He could commune with him. He could have conversations. How many of you would like to know what in the world did God and Adam talk about? That's, that's a crazy thought. But here's something that should be crazier. What in the world could God and Gordon be talking about? A Ralph or Noel or Alicia or Ron, right? What in the world could we be talking to him about? What are the conversations we could be having with the creator of the universe? He says, thou art fair, my love. Thou art fair. You are beautiful. And then he says this, you have dove's eyes. I think that the big overarching picture here is, is she only have, has eyes for him. She's just mesmerized. 
by him. Right? That would be the only way that he could, he could really pay attention to her eyes. Right? If she was looking over here and looking over there and looking at this over here, it's because she is gazing at him that he's able to define her eyes. And do you know that Jesus says this? Jesus says, If thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. The writer of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into that same image, even by the Spirit of the Lord. You have dove's eyes. Now we know in the scripture that dove's are symbolic of several things. The first thing is this, the Holy Spirit. When he looks into my eyes, does he see reflections of his spirit? You know that the Holy Spirit is searching the deep things of God. He's searching our hearts. He's at work within us. And, and he's the one that testifies of Christ to me. Right? He, he's the one that's, that's enacting and enabling this communion that I'm having with Christ. He says, you have dove's eyes. You know, they say that the eyes are the windows of the soul. Doves are also symbolic of peace in the scripture. And she's just gazing into his eyes and he's like, wow, you're at peace. And when you and I fully grasp the love he has for us, that's what he'll see in our eyes. It's peace. I mean, you think about this country girl, right? I mean, her lot in life was to work in this vineyard. We, we don't know anything about her father because he's not mentioned in the song whatsoever. He's probably deceased. She's got a mother and a younger sister, as we'll learn, and she's got two brothers that are mentioned and they are hateful to her, potentially half-brothers. She's had a rough life. And the prospect of anything great happening to her was Neil. I can relate. Right? I was, I was working hard and laboring and slaving, and I had been mistreated, and I had no hope of anything great happening until this strange shepherd came along. And he loved me. I wasn't even experiencing love in my own family, my own household like the Shulamite until he comes along. And he says things to me like, you are fair, my love. And I'm like, what? You have dove's eyes. Doves are also symbolic of purity and innocence. She is faithful to him. Right? She only has eyes for him. And when he looks into her eyes, he's looking into the depths of her soul, and that's what he sees. I wonder what he sees in me. What does he see when those eyes gaze into mine? I hope he sees his reflection because I will not look away. Right? My eyes are fixed. On him, And as a result, I am filled with his spirit. I am filled with peace. I am filled with purity and innocence. She responds, verse 16. Oh, no, behold, thou art fair. She says, I'm not fair. You're fair. What's interesting here is she uses the same Hebrew word, but she uses it in the masculine sense. So he's saying, you are beautiful. You are beautiful. She says, oh, no, you are handsome. These are conversations in the countryside between this couple in courtship. And this is what it ought to sound like. I was counseling someone several months back, and my heart kind of ached in the conversation because this individual... In our conversation, had never told the Lord that they love him. They, they said this with tears running down their face. And I'm like, it is obvious to me that you love him. But they were like, well, 
yeah, but I just know my love is not perfect and I, I don't want to be dishonest before the Lord and I don't want to tell him that I love him when, well, I know sometimes that I don't act like I do. And I'm like, do you think God would like to hear you say what I know is in your heart because there's a language rolling down in liquid form on your face. It is obvious that you love the Lord and he's not expecting your love to be perfect before you say it. And so I hope there's no one here tonight who's like, well, I just don't really tell the Lord that I love him because kind of like Peter, it's like, I, I like you, Lord. But let's remember Peter. He met Peter where he was and told Peter there's coming a day when you're going to be able to say what you wish you could say today. But I'll meet you right here. I'll take I like you. You are fair, my love. You are fair. You have dove's eyes. No, she says, you are handsome, my beloved. And look what she says. Yea, and you're pleasant. You are pleasant. She says, you are a joy to be around. You make my day. When you show up to the vineyard, it's like, ah. Oh, Psalm 16, I believe it's verse 11, says, In his presence is fullness of joy, and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. It is a pleasure to be in God's presence. I love teaching, but like tonight, Gabe's leading us in worship. It is obvious that the Holy Spirit is moving and God's presence just kind of rests, you know, like a, like a dew on an early morning. And it's just kind of like, Lord, I know you gave me a message, but couldn't we just stay here for just a little bit longer? She says, you are pleasant. It is just, it is a joy to be around you, to be with you. And now this is why I believe the rest of verse 16 and 17, I believe that they're on the, in the countryside. Now, some scholars think that they're in Solomon's house. I don't see that because we haven't got to the wedding yet. There's no indication of anything other than courtship at this point. So if, if you want to kind of go that direction, you're welcome to do so. I don't. I don't. I don't see it just yet. But look what she says. Also, our bed is green. That word bed there carries the idea of couch, but it's really a place of reclining. Our bed is green, the beams of our house are cedar, and our rafters of fir. Here's what I believe she's saying, right? He's come to the vineyard. They're off on a walk in the countryside, and they're exchanging love, and they're exchanging conversation and compliments and talking with one another. They find this grassy place to just sit back and recline, to enjoy each other's company. They're looking up into the canopy, and there's cedar trees and fir trees. And here's what I think she's saying. I could live right here with you from now on. I would be fine if this was my bed and this was my house. I'm reminded of Peter, right? Peter's on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus has this encounter, and, and Peter and James and John, and they're beholding it. And, and in the middle of all this, Peter's like, Lord, it is good to be here. This is a good place. It had nothing to do with the place, right? They could have been on the Sea of Galilee. They could have been by the Dead Sea. They could have been in the desert. It wouldn't have mattered. But Peter's like, we ought to stay here. I think that's what the Shulamite is saying. I think what she's saying is, is what we find Paul learning in Philippians chapter 4. Paul says, in whatever state I find myself in, to be content. Have we come to the place where we appreciate his presence so much, where we enjoy our encounter with him, that like Paul, it doesn't matter if I'm in the synagogue, in the temple, in the house of a believer, or sitting in a jail cell. It is good, Lord, to be here because you are here. You're here. So there they are. They're just sitting there, probably green, lush. 
And does not the psalmist say, David, you make me to lie down in green pastures. You just, you just make every place a good place. Now, verse 1 kicks off, and so many scholars use verse 1 for Christ. But Jesus isn't speaking here. The, the Shulamite is speaking here. This is not even Solomon, which is a, a type of Jesus in this song. This is the Shulamite. And they take this and say, oh, Jesus is the rose of Sharon. He's the lily of the valley. And, and they try to say that, oh, it's because he's so great and beautiful and he comes out of the desert. And that's not even what's being said here. This is the Shulamite. And she says, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. And here's what she's saying. Now, there's... Scholars debate over what is this rose of Sharon. They're saying for sure it's not a rose. They say it could be. There's all kinds of speculation of what it can be. And the same with the lily. But both of these were just common wildflowers. They were everywhere. They were well known. And so what she's saying is, is I'm, just, I'm just an ordinary girl. There's nothing really special about me. I, I'm just a country girl. I'm just a common, everyday somebody. And notice his response. Oh, you're a lily, all right. But you're a lily among thorns. So, if you're just a common lily... You're in the middle of all thorns. That's the way he saw her. Now, thorns, Genesis 3.18. A picture of the fall. A picture of the fall. The Lord looks at you and I, believers, disciples, those who are born again in his name and by his grace, He does not see us the way that he sees the world out there. It's pick on Peter night. You remember Peter? Peter goes up on the housetop. And, and he, he's just kind of there praying and he just falls asleep. He, he kind of has a knack for that, right, in the, in the scripture. He just falls asleep. But he goes into this trance and he sees this vision. And do you remember what the Lord said to Peter? Do not call common what I have cleansed. She says, I'm just the rose of Sharon. I'm just a lily of the valleys. I, I'm just an ordinary girl. I, I, there, there's nothing special. I'm just common. And he says, oh, no, you are anything but common. You are a lily among thorns. When the Lord looks at us, in the midst of everyone that's still caught in the briar patch of their fallenness and sin. He sees a lily. He sees something beautiful and something special. Not common. Not common. We're just not common to him. The writer of Hebrews, when he lists the hall of faith, do you remember what he says? The world was not worthy of these This is a special breed of individuals. When you walk with God, you can't be common. It changes you. It transforms you. And he says, you are a lily among thorns. So is my love among the daughters. You're anything but common. Once again, would the Holy Spirit help us tonight to see ourselves the way that God does. I know we tell ourselves we're nothing special. I know the enemy constantly reminds us of our faults and our failures and our shortcomings, and we probably spend way too much time focusing on that. Do you remember Paul even said, if you judge me, it's not a big deal. He says, I don't even judge myself. 
Paul didn't lay down at night and psychoanalyze everything that he said and did. Okay, did I say that right? Did I not say that right? Did I do that right? Did I, what was my attitude? Was, he says, you know what? I've learned to let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. He can do a lot better job at convicting my heart and dealing with my sin. I'm just going to rest in his grace and in his love. Good stuff, huh? Verse 3, as the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. So he just said, you're, you're a lily among thorns. All the other daughters are just thorns. They're just brambles. They're just briar patches. You are this lily. And she says, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, you, <laughs> it's that kind of thing, right? It's, it's, they're outdoing one another. It's glorious. What a conversation. Out complimenting one another. What, what, what are those, that old cartoon, the chipmunks? Oh, no, but after you. Oh, but, but after you. No, oh, in, 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 indubitably. No, after. It's that kind of thing. They're just like, oh, no, no, you're great. No, 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 you're great. No, you're wonderful. You're even more wonderful. You're beautiful. No, 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 you're handsome. You're, you're a lily among thorns. No, you're an apple tree in the middle of all the woods. This is the conversation that could be had with the saints and their Savior. Yes, we can say, Lord, bless us. Lord, heal us. Lord, help us. Lord, protect us from the storm. There's nothing wrong with those prayers. But may the Lord help us to elevate our conversations above and beyond that. Maybe we should take more time to escape the vineyard and have a walk in the countryside and really have a loving conversation with our Creator. Now, once again, with the flowers, scholars debate over this because most likely apples were not, they think, well, maybe it's apricot tree, they're, whatever. I'm not going to get into the botany of trying to determine what it is, but I know this, I love being in the woods. Anybody else love being in nature in the woods? Yeah, I'm in good company. Those of you who don't, you ought to get out there. And, and if you want to go for a walk in the woods, I'll, I'll go with you one day just to go out there with you and let you experience it's it's wonderful but but here's something that's rare right when you're out in the middle of the woods you're walking along the forest is full of trees but not fruit trees so when you're walking along in the woods and you come across a fruit tree you've come across something very rare and you've come across a blessing because contrary to what some of the movies show you, that you could just fill a backpack full of gear and you could just go out there in the wilderness and you could just live indefinitely. Good luck with that. It's, 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 not, it's, it's not like that, right? I mean, unless you love pine cones, right, and pine straw soup or whatever. I mean, there's, just, there's just not a lot out there like that. I mean, you can eat grubs and, and there's some... Mushrooms you can eat. Be careful with that because some of them will kill you. And it's just, it's kind of crazy out there. But he's, she's saying to him, you're like a walk in the woods and coming across something that is so rare and so wonderful. There's what earth science calls microclimates. You've probably experienced, if, you, if you're not even sure what it is, but, but depending on the natural terrain or maybe like a patch of trees in an open space or near a waterfall, you feel the water and the coolness. It's a microclimate. It, it's a different climate. It's an atmosphere. It's kind of like what we were singing. The atmosphere is changing now because the Spirit of the Lord is here. It's that kind of thing. All the surrounding environment and climate is, is the way that it is, but you've stepped into a micro... It's like if you've ever driven through the country with your windows down. If you ever ride motorcycles, you can really feel it. that's why I love riding motorcycles you smell everything you feel everything but if you've rode around with the windows down you're on a country road and you go into this dip and you cross this little bridge all of a sudden it gets cool and damp and you're like ooh, and then you drive out of it and it changes that's a micro climate and she says that's what you're like 
I'm walking along in the woods and I find this place that is special, it is rare, it is different, it's a microclimate, it's, it's, it's a total different atmosphere. And I believe with all my heart the Lord wants us to live in that. When people are frantic and people are angry and people are worried and people are stressed, that we're just kind of, just, we're just sitting around under the apple tree. Right? It shouldn't be that way. Everybody else is just in the woods. And they're looking at us going, what is your problem? Are you nuts? Not at all. I'm just chilling under the apple tree, man. I have found the place where I need to be. And look what she says. She says, you're, you're this way among all the sons. So I just sat down. It's like, you know what? I, I, <laughs> you just don't find this anywhere else. So I'm just going to sit down. I'm going to be still and. I'm going to know that he is God. Amen. Now, we, we, we won't turn to it, but if, if you're jotting down notes, in chapter 1, verse 7, if you remember, she asked him a question. She actually asked two questions in one. She says, where do you feed and rest your flock? She wanted to know because she wanted to spend some time and hang out with him. She was looking to be fed and she was looking for rest. And she says, you're like walking in the woods and finding a fruit tree. And man, I'm just going to sit down because I have found what my soul was looking for. I can be fed here. And I can find rest here. So I'm just going to I'm just going to take a seat. She says, I'm going to sit down under the shadow with great delight. And his fruit was sweet to my taste. Did not David say in Psalm 34, oh, taste, verse 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And that's what he wants us to experience. In John 15, Jesus says, abide in me. Abide in me. I am the what? The vine. I'm the vine, you're the branches, abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. Now we tend to think fruit benefits the people around us, and it does. But have you ever thought about the benefit the fruit has on your life? Right, Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith, right? All of those, are they not sweet? Isn't it a sweet experience? I know it has been for me because... I have not arrived. I'm like Paul in Philippians chapter 3. I have not arrived. I have not attained. But I am more loving today than I have ever been in my life. And I, it is a sweet experience. I am more joyful than I have ever been in all of my life. And it's sweet. I mean, it's just like eating. It's like, wow, this. The Lord's been dealing with me with my diet. And so I'm I'm. I'm getting rid of most of, I say most, not all, most, and it probably will never be all, but most of the junk from my diet, and, and, and I'm learning that fruit is actually sweet. Now, when you're eating cakes and cookies and, and all of that stuff, fruit is sour and ick, right? But when you stop eating that stuff and fruit becomes the sweet in your life, it's very sweet, and, and it's perfect, right? It's Nobody, nobody eats, well, you might eat several bowls of Fruity Pebbles, right? You just add more milk, add more cereal, add more milk, and you're in this race to, you know, until you get to the end of the box or the end of the, end of the gallon. But, but fruit, are, you just end up eating just the right amount. Most of the time it's like, man, what's wrong with you? I ate 15 bananas. I mean, most people don't do that, right? It's, it satisfies you, right? It's, there's just something. And this is what she's saying. I have found a place. I have found the place that my soul is satisfied. And I'm just going to rest here. I'm just going to sit here and I'm, I'm going to enjoy your presence. And, and under the shadow, right? Psalm 91.1, he that dwelleth under the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. There's that microclimate. There's this, there's this place in God that is sweet and nourishing. Verse 4, he brought me into the house of bank, he brought me into the banqueting house. Literally in the Hebrew, this is the house of wine. 
Once again, scholars debate over what this actually means. I think in context, it's pretty clear they're, they're around the vineyard. That's where she worked. He, he came along and he would visit and they would, they would have courtship there and they would walk along. And he, he brought me to this place. Remember, wine is symbolic of joy and celebration. He brought me to the house of joy, right? I, once again, Jesus, John 15, I am the vine. There is no more joyful place than abiding in Christ. No more joyful place. And look what she says. His banner over me is love. He doesn't just love me secretly. She says, he spreads a banner over me. Like when you, when, if you've ever traveled through like small towns in, in countryside, there's, they, they stretch banners across you know, the, the, the road on certain occasions. I don't know, some of you are looking at me like, what are you talking about? Maybe I've been to some weird places, but, but you, you know, you, you go up north in these little bitty towns and communities, and they, anyway, they do. He, he, he spreads this banner, right? The writer of Hebrews says that God is not ashamed to be called our God. And I don't know if you feel this way, but I feel this way a lot. I feel like God loves me more than he loves everybody else. I know he doesn't. I know he doesn't. He's of no respecter of persons. The Bible is clear. But I don't know. Do you ever feel? I just feel like he just loves me so much. He loves me too much. And he just lets the whole world see it. All right? He just like, he loves to take his children and just display them. I mean, think about it. He says, I'm the God of Abraham. What an honor. Think about that. God says, I'm his God. He's name dropping. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I'm the God of Israel. And he would say of us, I'm the God of Katie. I'm the God of Mark. I'm his God. I'm her God. Think about that. His banner over me is love. So everybody knows it. It's on display for the whole world to see. How could I be ashamed of a God like that? How could I be ashamed of a God like that? Two more verses. Three more verses. Yeah, four. I can't count. <laughs> Where would I be if I didn't have this help? He brought me into the banqueting house and his banner over me is love. And then she says this, stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. Now, in the King James, it, it, it could be misunderstood. She's not saying, I'm sick of love. That's not what she's saying. She's literally saying, I am lovesick. I'm just, I am beside myself. Now, flagons is another thing that's debated by scholars. Is it flagons of wines? Some translate this as, as cakes of raisins. So she, she's asking for fruit, and she's like, I'm faint. <laughs> Whew, somebody help me out here. I, I need some nourishment because I'm weak in the knees. I, I'm just lovesick. He, he is overwhelming me. You ever felt that way? There's been times I've felt like, Lord, you just got to back up a little bit. Because I'm not, I'm not going to be able to take it. I'm, not, I, I'm just not going to be able to take it. Just, just, I just need it. You're just overwhelming. In a good way, but, but you're just overwhelming to me. I'm hoping I can pronounce this right. If I don't, you can look it up and figure it out. But it's interesting what love does to people. Neurologically, all kinds of things take place in, in the mind and chemically in the body. And, and when, when, when somebody falls in love, there's, there's neurotransmitters that take place. All right. Phenethylamine. That's the best I can do. But it's a, it's a chemical that's released in the brain. It, the body and the brain is flooded with this chemical when someone falls in love. It's, it's this attraction neurotransmitter. It's, and, and she's describing this. She's just, oh, he's, uh, it, 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 it takes away your appetite. You just, it, it makes you feel all kinds of weird stuff, right? 
And what's interesting is science tells us that it lasts for about four and a half years. It's crazy, right? You're in love and it's just, oh. But after about four and a half years, it starts to wane and dwindle. And I just saw some faces like, oh. But other neurotransmitters take its place. Right about four years, another chemical called oxytocin starts to be released within the body. And what's interesting about oxytocin is it's the chemical that bonds mothers with their infants. And so what happens is it's like it's almost as if one would well, maybe, get the idea that we were wired and created for monogamy. Because you've got this chemical transmitter that's flooding the, 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 the body and the mind for this four and a half year period, but then there's a shift and a transition that goes from attraction to attachment. It's not that attraction goes away, but, but there's a, a shifting that takes place within that relationship. I thought that was pretty cool, right? I mean, how God operates, but she's feeling this, right? She's, her, her, all of these chemicals are racing through her, and she's just like, oh, girlfriend, somebody help me. I'm, I'm, about to, I'm about to fall out. God wants us to feel that way about his love, yeah. and we should be that way. We know the God of the universe. He's not only our creator, but he's our Christ, right? He's our comforter. He's, he's our Lord. We're going to spend eternity with him. And yet we allow that snake in the garden to mess things up, right? We, we've talked about it before, but, but there's all these implications of, of gardens and vineyards and outdoors and fragrance and all of this stuff. God planted a garden, and that's where he communed with man. We see Jesus talk about the same idea, paradise. You'll be with me in paradise with a thief on the cross. We see paradise again in the book of Revelation. We also see a garden. We also see a river. It's, it's, it's interesting as you look through the scripture, these, these themes continue on. And this idea of paradise is, is some translation even use paradise to describe Eden or in place of the word Eden. Persian kings would plant gardens, their own kingly gardens, to try to replicate what Eden would have been like. And when they wanted to honor subjects within their kingdoms, they would let them walk with the king in their personal garden. And there's this conversation that's happening on the countryside, right? This, this conversation between this couple. She says, I'm lovesick. I'm, I'm just beside myself. I'm just, I'm giddy. You ever, you ever been around somebody that's in love? All of you are supposed to be saying, yes, yes, of course I have. <laughs> that's kind of that's depressing. I'm looking around the room and there's couples in here. Have you ever seen that meal? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But, it's, but it is. It's like, oh, and they're just they're like, there's a cat for a hurricane coming. Oh, that's good. You know, it's that kind of thing, right? They're just, they're just beside themselves. Look what she says, verse 6. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. Deuteronomy 33, we're told that underneath are the everlasting arms. And over and over again, the psalmist says, He doth withhold me, or hold me up by his right arm. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, and some of you can probably think I'm absolutely nuts, but there's been a few times in my life where I could literally feel the embrace of the Lord. There have been times where I would, I can remember one specifically where I was distraught, I was in this, this rough place, and it was as if I could just feel the Lord just, just bear hug me, and I just began to weep as he held me. Now, obviously, he didn't do that literally, I don't think, but, but you would have never been able to convince me otherwise at that time. But she's just, that's what she's like, oh, he just, I'm secure. 
I'm okay. I'm in his arms. Let's paraphrase it. I got you, boo. Is that okay? I don't know. Some of you are shaking your heads. I don't know. <laughs> it's a pet name. It, okay. <laughs> Last verse. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the roes and by the hinds, this is like deer, that type of thing, who are easily startled of the field, that ye stir not up nor awake my love till he please. Now there's differing interpretations of this. Here's what I think she's saying. Don't interrupt me. Don't you interrupt this. Don't wake me up. This is... This is a dream come true. This is, this is a wonderful place that I'm at. And don't you dare. Don't, don't, don't you? That's the way it ought to be. Oftentimes, we're trying to find places to fit Christ into our busy lives. Unfortunately. But what it ought to be is the exact opposite. Our attitude should be like the Shulamite. Listen, no, uh, uh, don't call me, don't text me. I'm with him. I, mm -mm, don't, you, don't you disrupt this. Don't you distract this. Right? I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to enjoy the Lord. Amen? Let's stand.